All right, welcome everybody. So um, it's a really great pleasure to welcome today Professor Geoffroy Lesur from Grenoble in France. So Geoffroy is, is an expert in a lot of things. Uh, in his hydrodynamics in particular, connected to instabilities, what the dust does, what the gas does, and how this all together in form of this evolution. Um, so he started his PhD already in Grenoble, so he's a very stationary guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> very stationary. Uh, in 2004, ended his PhD in 2007, and he was to France, in Grenoble, uh, where he did then, yeah, uh, Research in the form of CNS. I think this was your time when you have been promoted to come in, right? Yes. Um, doing his habilitation not so far away, not, not, not so long ago, five years ago. And then since 2022, he's actually the director of the research, of the research in IPAC, which is the uh, Institute for Planetary Astronomy. Yes. <laughs> and so he he um, yeah he has he has won a lot of prizes and for me the biggest prize however is this chapter twelve or thirteen huh thirteen the procedures uh, PP seven conference where he led the chapter about hydro MHD and dust gas dynamics together with a bunch of international colleagues and he was leading this um, and then he is also I mean just to to mention one more thing is that he running an ERC consolidator project uh, in the novel called MHD Discs or MH Discs, and it's still running. And one of the reasons we are here is that we would like to ask for an FWF ANR twinned application. We are currently working at this, and I'm very, look, very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you for uh, coming here today, and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's been a very pleasant day, uh, and I'm going to do my best to keep it that way. Uh, so the idea of uh, this seminar is to uh, explore with you some of uh, the results we've been obtaining in Grenoble. So in my team, um, we are focusing on dynamics of disks, uh, disks of various kinds from uh, disks in AGNs to disks in protoplanetary disks. So here I will focus on, on uh, protoplanetary disks, um, but we also work on uh, disks on black holes and on compact objects. Uh, so this is a work I've been uh, mostly animating. I've not done much. Uh, this is mostly the work of Anton Rion, or Rion, uh, Gellar Vafda, uh, and uh, bits from uh, Jean Amorcion, who are postdocs and uh, former postdocs for fun and PhD students uh, with me. Right, so let me set the stage. Um, you know that, I guess. Uh, so when, uh, during the stellar formation process, we start with a large envelope. This envelope collapses and under the uh, influence of rotation and magnetic fields. It forms a central uh, object, which is a protostar surrounded by a uh, remaining material that has too much angular momentum, that is an excess of angular momentum, that, that leads to a circumstellar disk that we start to see here. So initially, this disk is fed by the envelope. So it gets bigger and bigger. And as the envelope clears up, uh, you end up in the so-called class one stage, uh, where the star gets uh, Slightly bigger, you still have a lot, you still have stuff falling in the disk, but the envelope has been cleared up. And eventually it all settled down into a class two object, which is typically the kind of disk we observe nowadays. Uh, if you think of HL Tau, it's uh, typically between these two stages. Uh, this stage lasts about one million years, and it's called the classical Titori phase. And eventually the material, and especially the gas, which is in the disk, clears up, and you end up with a system which is mostly made of dust and pebbles rotating around the central object, and that's called debris. And here, I'm going to focus mostly 
on that stage, uh, the class two stage, that is, we don't have any envelope left, and the disk is fairly isolated. That's with an assumption. Uh, disks are not always isolated, uh, but I will not consider that here uh, for simplification. Right, so the first thing we can say about those disks is that structures are common. Uh, you might have seen this plot. Uh, this is a survey uh, called D-sharp, uh, made on the ALMA telescope. And that is showing uh, the millimeter continuum emission. And what you can see in that is that in all these disks, we have ring-like structures here, here. You might also be able to spot some sort of spiral waves here, and also some non axisymmetric features you have one here. Um, so, as a matter of fact, none of these look homogeneous. Okay, you have tons of structure in them, um, and that seems to be uh, very common. So, I will not address here the question where are these coming from. I will try to address that maybe five later. But keep in mind, all of these disks, when we look at them, they have structures, and their structures here are probing the dust distribution. So, essentially, when you see that it's bright. It's because you have a lot of dusty material, and when it's uh, dark, it means that you don't have much dust in that region, okay? The second thing is that, of course, we know that planets are forming in these disks, even though it's uh, pretty hard to detect one directly in those disks. There is one case uh, in PGS-70 uh, where um, a disk was detected here, and this disk was surrounded by its uh, circumplanetary disk. So that is a disk, miniature disk around the planet. Uh, so you can see here that the, the actual disk is uh, closer to what's called the transition disk, that is between the class two and class three stage. You have a white cavity inside. Here you have a sort of big ring of, big ring of dust, and inside here we have the signature of a circumplanetary disk. So planets are forming in the systems. And finally, last but not least, uh, these disks are astrophysical accretion disks. So what it means is that the gas that is rotating around the central star is being accreted, okay? Material is falling, essentially, onto the central star. And putting down there the typical mass accretion rate that is measured in each of these disks. So you see that you have tons of structure, so it looks like nothing much is happening, but you are still accreting at a non-negligible mass accretion rate, right? typically about 10 to minus 7 solar masses per year of gas. It's falling onto the star, okay? So those guys are not a steady state. It is not stationary. It is very dynamical, even though it looks very structured, okay? So the dilemma for today is to try to explain everything. You want to explain that you have gas accretion, gas is flowing inward and eventually reaching the central star. These disks are structured, so they are not smooth as in this picture. You have wings, you have gaps. And finally, you need to form planets. We observe all of it. So you need to explain all of these aspects if you want to have some sort of realistic model. And I'm going to focus on each one of these aspects in the so uh, first, gas accretion. Gas accretion is a, a very old problem in astrophysics. Uh, and uh, here's my take on the problem. Uh, that's what Peter mentioned, this uh, chapter in TP7, after two years of intense discussion, I should say. Um, I should point out also that uh, initially, we wanted to have, the initial proposal was to have six co-authors. We ended up with 18. Uh, it's been a difficult time. Um, so there are some answers here, and I will try to make a digest uh, of the answers. So what drives accretion? The first thing to keep in mind is that if you want to accrete material, so if you want to accrete a parcel of gas that is rotating around anything that is massive, you need to remove its angular momentum. As simple as that. Okay. If you keep the angular momentum, the thing stays on a circle. Think of a satellite. If you want to the satellite to fall, you need to break it. Okay, you need some way to stop it. So the way to stop it could be the atmosphere. The atmosphere just breaks the satellite, falls. 
It could be with a rocket, uh, but you need something to remove the angular momentum of the material. Historically, you have essentially two ways. The first way, and uh, the first one which was used in the literature is the so-called turbulent disk model. So in this model, you assume, and that's a strong assumption, you assume that the disk is somehow turbulent, okay? So you have a mess inside the disk, you have eddies or the well, eddies, carry the angular momentum, okay? They were distributed, and in the end of the day, magically, you hope that this turbulence will be able to take the angular momentum that is inside and carry it outside by eddies that are taking pieces of angular momentum and throwing them outside, okay? So that's the idea. And so if you assume that, then you can define a sort of turbulent viscosity, uh, typically defined nu t, which is supposed to be proportional to the sound speed inside the disk times the disk thickness shown here. Okay, and you have a proportional the constant here, alpha, which depends on the system you're looking at. So that's one way. Now, of course, this means that the angular momentum stays inside the disk. You could say, well, um, you could imagine that it's going to flow outside of the disk if we assume that there is some external way to remove angular momentum. And we'll come to that later. So the first question to ask is, are disks really turbulent to use that sort of model? So the first thing you can try to do is to directly try to probe turbulence in the disk. So how do you do that? You take your favorite spectral line. Um, so you look at a specific molecule, the transition of a molecule. And uh, because the molecule, the, the line, profile of the molecule will be subject to first the Keplerian motion. So you will have some Doppler effect due to the Keplerian motion of the disk. You will have some Doppler effect due to the fact that you have thermal agitation, but you will have also a contribution due to the fact that the flow is turbulent. So your line will be spread out because you have turbulent motion. So if you can measure that, you can infer how much turbulence there is in your disk, okay, in principle. Except that it's not super easy because uh, you have several velocities involved in that game. First, the Kepler rotation, I write dk. Then you have the thermal velocity, which is much smaller than dk. And then you have the turbulence, which is even smaller than the thermal velocity, okay? So the signal you're looking at, if you want to pop turbulence, is like about two orders of magnitude weaker than the Doppler effect due to just the bulk Kepler motion. So it's very it's a very tricky game, but some people have tried that. Here is one result showing uh, a line profile for the CO3 two resonance uh, transition, and showing that in order to fit this profile, you need to assume that you have a very low amount of turbulence that is in terms of uh, typical velocities involved in the system. So typically less than four percent of the sound speed. This is very low compared to what you would need to explain. The mass accretion rate to observe. So that's one thing. When you try to measure the directly probe turbulence in the systems, well, you don't find it. You find that the disk is laminar. Another way to look at that is a bit more indirect. Uh, turbulence is affecting the settling of those grains. How comes? It's because so if we look at a disk seen from uh, edge on. This disk will be made of gas in blue and also of tiny dust grains in that. And these tiny dust grains, because of the vertical gravity, they will tend to fall down to the disk midplane. Okay. And on the opposite side, the gas, if it is turbulent, is going to steer your dust grains. That's going to make your dust disk become thicker. So you will have a competition between dust settling, which is just due to the gravity of the central star, and the vertical diffusion, which is essentially driven by the gas turbulence. So if somehow you can measure the thickness of the dust layer, you can infer what is the efficiency of the turbulence, okay, how much turbulence you have. Okay, so how do we measure that? Let's assume that we have a disk um, made of rings. Remember there's rings we've seen. And let's assume that uh, each of these rings is made of dust, 
with a relatively large thickness. Then what you have, if you assume that the dust disk is thick, so diffusion is efficient, then what you have is essentially uh, each ring is a torus, okay? So seen with some inclination, it looks like that. Okay, you have torus. If now the dust has been settling down, then what you have is tiny disks that are super flat. What you have here. And if you change the inclination, it works. You see that. So you see the torus here on the side thick the, for thick disk. And here you have slim disks like that in the thin case. And as you can see, depending on the inclination angle, if you now look at the gaps, the, the aspect of the gap will change depending whether the disk is thick or thin. Okay. If I just pose that thing, uh, and if I look at 45 degrees, say, you can see that the gap here, here, is much thinner than here. Okay. That's just a geometrical effect. Well, here it's not the case anymore. So if you look at the shape of the gap, if you move around, you can induce how thick is the dust layer, even in a disk which is seen with a average inclination. So this is a game that has been done for HL Pell. So that's an old image, a much better image now. This is HL Pell seen from a thin disk, that's a toy model. And this is for a thick disk. Um, and what you can see or not, that the gap width is more or less constant as you move around the central object. So that doesn't fit this case because then uh, on the mid, along the minor axis, you should also almost see no gap. And it's not what we see here. We see a gap with a width which is almost constant. And that corresponds to the hypothesis where the dust disk is super thin. Meaning that you should have a very efficient settling and almost no diffusion of dust grains vertically. Okay? So this, again, and that's totally uh, different from the live or in argument, this indicates that there is very weak turbulence in this system. And you could do even better. You could look at the disk edge on. Then you can directly probe the disk uh, structure, the vertical structure. And this is what has been done in HH30. What I'm showing here, black and white, is the HST image of HH30. This so HH30 is a disk which is seen exactly edge on. So what you see here, On both sides, you have a jet. So we have the disk here, and you can see the black stuff is actually the disk surface that is scattered light, that is emitted by the star, scattered by the dust floating above the disk. So that's on both sides. Okay, so that's the disk surface. The red stuff is millimeter sized dust grains. So the black stuff is micron sized dust grains. These guys are floating. The wet stuff is millimeter sized dust grains. It, it's all settled in the display plane. It's as thin as you can resolve it, okay? If you want to explain that, you need to have very low amount of turbulence because otherwise this thing should look like a potato. It is not a potato. It is a crack, as we say. So. <laughs> so there is no turbulence in there. Conclusion, this is a nice model. Every theoretician like it, but, it's wrong. Okay. Yeah. It is not supported by observation. Okay. So we should move away from it. Okay, so what do we do then? Uh, well, we do something else. Something else is, well, you have to assume that your angular momentum is extracted by some other mechanism. And my favorite mechanism is the one that involves a large-scale magnetic field. Why? It's because all of the systems we have in astrophysics are always embedded in a non magnetic field. So I don't see why There's, this should not be embedded in large field. So what happens then is that this field is going to break the disk and that's going to take away the angular momentum in the wind, okay? So the angular momentum is not transported inside the disk, it is actually evacuated, okay? Right, so this cannot be described as an alpha disk. And the only real requirement is that you, you need to assume that you have a large scale magnetic field that threads the disk. Magnetic fields. So this is usually a bad word. Uh, depending who you ask, uh, you might have different reactions. Uh, so for theoreticians, this is just B, 
fairly reasonable with kind of the control. To go down for modelers, this looks kind of okay. Uh, I don't know, elastic stuff, but yeah. Yeah. people seem to be a bit worried. And then hopes up. <laughs> no way. <laughs> you can't do that. Um, it's actually fairly simple. Um, so let's take the theoretician point. Uh, why should you have a magnetic field of start? Well, because their systems, as I showed you, form in starting from a giant molecular cloud, which collapses under itself. So there are solutions of a giant molecular cloud collapsing under, under itself. If you assume that you have the typical galactic field, okay, micro goes. Uh, and when this thing collapses, then you will drive the magnetic field inward during the collapse, and you will trap a good fraction of the field in the disk. You will actually trap a large fraction because you will reach about 100 milligos in the bulk of the disk just following that collapse. And 100 milligos is actually huge on a dynamical perspective. So we do not have any direct measurement because this is small for, from an observer perspective because it's quite difficult to measure field at such a low uh, strength. But just from the fact that they, that is formed from core collapse means that they should be threaded by a large field field. And that's the field that is coming from the, the initial stages of uh, the formation. So the next thing is, switch that up again. No, it doesn't want me to switch that up. Um, the next thing is a little experiment to explain why uh, a large scale field is enough. So if we consider um, a disk, again, made of some electrical conductor, here it's I1. And if you say that you add some large scale field, the thing just breaks, okay? That's called magnetic breaking. And it's due to uh, Foucault currents that are circulating inside the disk. Now, if you were doing the same experience, but this time with something that rotates around a central object because of gravitational forces, if you break something that is in orbit, the thing falls, okay? If you were doing the same thing, the material here would just collapse. So you would accrete as simple as that. Okay. So it's essentially the mechanism here I'm talking about. It's you have a disk made of conductive material. It is threaded by a large scale field, and as a result, it's going to slowly but surely accrete material. Now the thing is, here in this little experiment, uh, we've been using iron. Uh, disks are not quite made of iron. So uh, the question is, are disks really electrical conductors so that you can actually have electrical currents or not? And that's a tricky question. Why? It's because um, you don't have that many sources of ionization in these disks. So this is a typical disk and some typical uh, distances, 1 AU and 30 AU. And uh, the first source of ionization, so source of free electrons, if you want, in the gas phase, is just thermal ionization. So technically, when your gas gets above typically a thousand Kelvin, then it becomes ionized sufficiently so that we can say that we are coupled to the magnetic field lines. Okay, and look, it looks like a typical plasma. Um, except that the thing that we look at in, with ALMA, for instance, yeah, yeah. So not good. Okay. it's fine to know that it's ionized, but we don't really care for our problem. Next, we have PIOVs, X-rays, emitted from the central star. The disk can only penetrate the, the top layers of the disk. And most of the action is actually taking place in the mid plane. So it's not good enough. And the last thing, that is secret ingredient, cosmic <laughs> rays. Cosmic rays, these are high energy protons that are traveling in the galaxy and that are sometimes uh, heating uh, disks like this one. And these cosmic rays, uh, they generate, uh, they remove electrons from, from the uh, molecules and that creates ionization. That works essentially in the outermost region of the disk. And there is a big uncertainty because we don't know how many cosmic rays actually manage to reach the disk. Uh, they can be screened, they can be generated on site. So you have like any magnitude of uncertainty on that. 
So bottom line is that uh, we are here in a region which is only very weakly ionized. Um, and that means that it's not the simple MHD that you have to take into account, but non-ideal MHD effects that are due to the fact that you only have a few charge carriers. So that means that you have to include ohmic diffusion, ambipolar diffusion, and the fault. And each of these effects is due to collisions between a charge carrier in the plasma and the neutrals, typically H2, that are in the gas phase. Okay. So I won't go into the details of how you compute that, but it's possible to compute those, provided that you have an idea of the chemical composition and of the ionization equilibrium of the system. And that's where Peter enters the scene. Uh, and that's what we did actually uh, back in the days um, with Wind T using Prodigo. We looked at here ohmic diffusion. So this is a map of ohmic diffusivity. Blue meaning that you are very diffusive, red meaning that you are weakly diffusive. So here, this is not MHD, okay? There's no copying to the main diffusion. So historically, uh, this region here in blue has been coined the dead zone. That's the region where you should not have any uh, magnetic couple. So people said, OK, that's fine, because we can still survive with something here at the surface. Outside of one AU, it should be fine as well. So you know, it should work. Except that, remember, there are three non-ideal effects. Now, if we look at ambipolar diffusion, same for same people. Ambipolar diffusion looks like that. And uh, it's known that you get the couple whenever this dimensionless number gets below 100. And now 100 is bad. So we were fine initially with the small dead zone. We are not fine anymore. Okay. What it means is that most of the disk is decoupled by ambipolar diffusion, and it's only the upper layers that are still coupled to the main field and in which you can't have the currents. So because of that, it's not super simple uh, to drive MHD in the systems, and you need to take into account the no, there's no ideal MHD effect, and you need to take into account the fact that the disk is vertically structured. Uh, so this game has been played. Uh, I've been playing it for quite some time. Uh, other people have been playing it. And here is a sample of uh, what I call wind solution that are uh, essentially steady state solution in which we assume that there is a large scale field and um, we let the large scale field create an MHD disk wind. So this wind uh, is shown here. This is as function of the field strength. So we start here with weak field and we go to stronger fields. And as you can see here, uh, here is shown the Mach number. Uh, so red meaning, meaning that you have very fast velocities and blue meaning that you have very low velocity. So you have the disk and you see that uh, you have the wind starts essentially here in the region where uh, you get ionized by the fire reason. And then uh, you have an outflow that extracts all of your angular momentum so that you can drive accretion in the system. Despite the fact that is, it is fully laminar, there's no turbulence. It's just matrix breaking essentially. It's matrix breaking happening at the surface. But this is a proof of principle that it can work. Uh, and you can get very decent solution here. Here you can see the field lines, and the field lines are distorted. Uh, here they are inclined, and they are almost straight in the, disc, in the disc. And that's because here you don't have any conductive material. So the field are just straight, just like in this room, and the earth field line are straight. So it's the same here. One of the conclusions of this is that uh, you can compute mass accretion rate using best models. I won't go into the details. But what is really important is that you can show that you can explain mass accretion rate of the order of 10 to minus 8 solar masses per year, which is about what is observed. Provided that you assume that you have a field which is about 1 milligos. OK? So it's a quite low field. It's actually much lower than what is expected from core collapse. So you have to get rid of a good fraction of the field uh, you have initially uh, to get this sort of mass accretion rate. But what is really important here is to notice that the mass accretion rate depends only weakly on the gas content of the disk. You see here, you have a power of 0.22. So you don't really care how much mass you have. The only thing you do care is how much field you have. Okay. 
So the field is controlling how much mass is being accreted. And you can have a very low amount of mass. If you keep the same field strength or almost the same, you will get the same mass accretion. That the more important thing is that the mass loss rate in the wind is of the order of the mass accretion rate. Uh, and that only depends weakly on the field strength. So you get a quite massive wind in the system. Okay, so that's a way, at least to me, to explain the mass accretion in the systems. So now let's look at what happens to the other two items, structure formation and planet formation. And we have about 15 minutes to go over that, which is perfectly reasonable. Um, so uh, the first thing about structure formation, I told you that uh, you know there's nice rings and gaps we see are really probing uh, the rings of dust in the system. So what happens if you add dust in those rings? Well, this is what happens. This is a model of an MHDD screen that we did with OpenReal. Uh, what is shown here is the gas density. You have a wind emitted from the disk surface. The disk mid plane is relatively quiet because we are weak electrical conductor. Um, this thing is accreting at 10 to minus 7 solar masses per year. And here on the right, we have a dust grains in the same simulation. And what you see is that the dust layer is much, much, much thinner than the gas is. Okay. This should remind you this HA. Very efficient settling of dust grains in this system. And if you look at the vertical profiles, of the dust density, it looks like that. So the blue curve, this is versus Z. This is the gas density. Um, the red, uh, sorry, no, not the red. The purple-ish dash line is what you would expect from full-blown um, turbulent this model. So you would expect to have a relatively thick uh, dust layer. In uh, red, this model, this right, and the orange thing is the ALMA constraints for the settling. So you see that we match the observed thickness for the dust layer with this sort of model, still keeping the mass accretion rate. Because so sometimes people say, okay, well, yeah, we can do dust settling, we just remove all of the dynamics and then it works. Yes, but then the mass accretion rate is zero. So it's not what we observe. So here you can explain both mass accretion and the setting. And you can even do more. You can do more because, as you might see here, the gas density is kind of bumpy. Uh, maybe it's not obvious from where you are, uh, but you see that it's not quite homogeneous. And actually, it's a feature of that sort of models. Uh, if we zoom in on one of these uh, region of the disk, this is what we have. This is a make it clear lines in this little box. And what you see is that the field lines have all accumulated in one region. If we look at the density, we see that this region where the main field lines have accumulated is essentially a void. Okay. So the field lines, they tend to accumulate in the gaps. There is a physical reason for that. I won't discuss in details, but it's essentially due to ambipolar diffusion. So, the end result of this is that you get spontaneity without asking for anything. You get structuration of the disk. Okay, you get this bumps. So these are actually wings. So this is a cut. You have wings in which you have magnetic field lines accumulating in the gaps, and you have low magnetic field ring of material. Okay. This is a feature which is not unique to our models. This has been seen by all of the people who've tried to do non-ideal MHD models of disks, no matter what. I'm showing you here an Excel. It's always the same story. You can see here in this paper by Scott Soriano, the field lines accumulating, black line are the field lines, they're all accumulating in the gaps. This is a paper by Curie, um, Sam Curie and Schoening Bai showing the same thing. Here our paper with Hongkong Real, here another paper, the three and Beijing showing the same story. The the ingredients are always the same. On people are diffusion, turn it off. Okay, can you explain then what we see 
Well, again, we add the size, the, the dust veins in these models. So this is, I'm not sure you can see, this is the gas density versus radius. So you have wings of gas. These wings are relatively low in amplitude for the gas. Because self-organization is something which is relatively weak, doesn't create gigantic gaps. So you have these uh, rings and gaps in the gap and with uh, a typical contrast, which is like a factor two or three. Now, the thing is that these things are pressure maxima. So they act as dust traps. So all the dust tend to naturally drift to uh, this pressure maxima. So now if you look at the dust density versus radius, you see that this was a linear scale. Now we have switched to log scales and here you have orders of magnitude in contrast between the gaps and the wind. Okay, so you create very uh, distinct uh, dusty winds uh, in these models, and they, they, they just come out of, of the non ideal image. You don't have to ask for it. And this is what you get once you, you take this model to what MC and you make a synthetic image. Well, you get these wings and you get the spectral signature of this system. So to me, this is quite indicative that you can create wings like that uh, without any planet. Uh, the only requirement really is the presence of a large scale field that is coming from the initial collapse of the system. Right. The next thing is about planets. So uh, up to now, we've been looking at disks without any planet. We've seen that we could explain mass accretion, and we could also explain the formation of our structures like things like that. Now, moving to planets, um, the question is, of course, uh, how do these large-scale wind perturb the planet disk interaction? So you might know that there's a lot of literature looking at uh, how planet can migrate in a disk, whether it migrates inward, outside, outward, whether it's stays here, whether it's destroyed. Um, it turns out that uh, the problematic is the following. If you look at people doing the dynamic of disks, we know, and now you are convinced, that um, we cannot use a turbulent disk model to look at the dynamics of the system. Okay, this is wrong. Uh, so people nowadays, people doing disks, believe that magnetized disk wings are probably the main accretion driver in their systems. If you look at the literature on planet disk interaction, they all focus on the viscous disk model, that is the turbulent disk model, which we know is more. And all of this model predict inward migration, which is a problem as well, because it means that you lose most of the planets. So maybe, maybe the two worlds should talk to each other, and uh, the idea we have was to say, okay, let's look at what's happening to a planet embedded in a windy disk. Okay. Do you still form gaps? And how do the planet migrate? So uh, to do that, so it's, it's actually a quite complicated problem because uh, you need to resolve uh, the physical scales that are around the planet. And you need to resolve the wind. And you need to resolve non-ideal MHD in a disk. Lot of things to resolve. Uh, so to do this sort of thing, we've used a code that we have developed in Poland called IDFIX. So this is the advertisement time. Uh, so IDFIX is a finite volume MHD code uh, that is designed to run on new exascale supercomputer that is accelerated uh, clusters. Uh, and the simulation I'm going to show you have been run on a French cluster that is using uh, and it's been using about a hundred GPU simultaneously. Uh, to do that. So you can you can play with it. It's now available on GitHub. So this is what it looks like. What, what I'm showing here is a cut of a disk uh, computed from IDFX. The initial state is a disk without any uh, planet in it. You might be able to spot that you already have wings that are quite shallow here. Um, that's because of such organization. And what we're going to do, we're going to add a planet Jupiter has planet right here, okay? So the cut will be at the planet location. So here we go, we have the planet. Oh, well, it's a bit shaggy. Um, yeah, well. <laughs> so you can see that you, you keep a large scale wind. Plays well on my laptop. 
Um, and what you might see also is that, so the planets start to form sort of cocoon here, which is actually a disk around the planet. So it's a second planetary disk that is forming around the planet. You start to see a gap here that is forming. So the planet is carrying a gap. You maintain a wind, and you might see here that you have some time variability. This is not your eyes. This is actually a vortex that is passing by even now and then. So very rich dynamics, uh, as you can see here. And now the question is, uh, okay, so how is it different from a standard uh, this, with this scenario? So uh, again, we're going to focus, this is the full domain view. Uh, so we're going to focus on this time that we can do. We won't talk about the wind here. Uh, and this is a view from the top where you see that the planet has carved a gap um, inside the disk. About five minutes. Yes. It's going to be good idea. So here's a plot showing you the surface density for different planet masses, starting from 10 of mass down to 3 Jupiter mass. So we look at the surface density of the disk. And here, the column represents different field strength. So what you can see is that as you increase the field strength, first from a 10 of mass planet, well, the planet doesn't carve a gap, but you still have gaps because of self-organization. Remember, you haven't made this window. It makes gaps. So here we are. We have gaps that has nothing to do with planet formation. They are here because of the wind. So we cover them. And then eventually you start to have gaps that are induced by the planet. You can see here and here for the most massive planets. So you can still form gaps in this planet, but these gaps have a very important property, which is that they are not symmetric. If you look carefully at that guy, for instance, where it's the most obvious, the planet is closer to the inner edge of the gap. It's slightly moved in one, okay? It's touching the inner gap, the inner edge of the gap. And it's the same for that guy, okay? So it is slightly dissymmetric. If you look at what's happening in the usual viscous disk, the planets are always at the middle of the gap. And here it's not. Why is it important? Because it changes everything. It changes everything. Uh, I'm going to show you why in a minute. This is what uh, the circulation around the planet looks like. So one of the important features is that um, we still maintain an accretion flow through the gap. I remind you that the mass accretion rate is dictated not by the density of the gaps, but by the field strength. And we have maintained a field spreading the gap. Therefore, we maintain a constant mass accretion rate through the gap. That's what we see here. This is a mass flow flowing from the outer edge of the gap to the gap to the inner disk. So despite the fact that you have gap in the system, it's not a barrier for the for the aqueous disk. You can still have material flowing through, and that's driven by the large scale magnetic flow. Okay. You also observe jets associated to the circumplanetary disk. So that one is kind of fun. This is very intermittent, but it's there. So the little disk itself can have its own outflow. And last but not least, remember I told you that the planet is slightly inside of the gap. So it's almost touching the inner edge. That means that planet migration is affected. Why? It's because uh, the, the torque due to the inner disk is pushing the planet outwards, while the torque due to the outer disk is pushing the planet inward. If your planet is close to the inner disk, it's going to feel the gravitational torque due to the inner disk and it's going to be pushed outwards. Hence, my Jupiter mass planet that is in red has a positive torque. So Jupiter is actually moving outward, while all of the, mis all of the viscous disk models predict inward migration. Okay. Well, this predicts outward migration. Why is the gap dissymmetric? It's because the magnetic um, wind is forcing an accretion flow, and that forces the gap to become dissymmetric. But I can show you that on, on the blackboard later, if you can. So, uh, well, the bottom line is that if you assume that uh, your disk is accreting thanks to an MHD disk wind, then the properties of planet migration are modified quite significantly. Okay, so we'll finish here. These are the take home messages. So first, uh, from observation, 
we know that disks are observed not to be turbulent. So we have this very efficient settling that we've seen in HH30, which is very illustrative of this fact. So an alternative to a turbulent disk model is to have that we is to assume that we have a wind-driven disk driven by a large-scale field. If we do that, then we can recover the white mass accretion rate in the laminar disk with the fact that the mass accretion rate is then controlled by the large-scale field that is threading the disk and not so much the surface of the disk. One of the side effects of these winds is that first uh, it leads to very strong settling, so it explains that, but it also leads to uh, the formation of large scale structures that are spontaneously formed, like winds and gaps, as seen here. And finally, uh, this means that if you form a planet and this is planet becomes sufficiently massive, then it should form a gap, but this gap is not an obstacle for the mass accretion flow, actually, matter is flowing through it. And that means that the gap is becomes dissymmetric, and this changes the magnitude direction. Uh, so that's quite important if you want to look at planet synthesis uh, population models. And with that, I will stop and thank you for your attention. Physics to a super complicated, <laughs> ideal MHD, 3D hydrodynamics with everything. Um, so, do we have any questions? Yeah. Thank you for this wonderful talk. So, you definitely have basically solved uh, quite some some uh, chemistry questions at the side, but let's see. So, you basically said that the accretion rate depends basically on the magnetic field, and I have kind of discussed away the the uh, column density. So, the what do you call it? The sigma um, mm -hmm. surface. Yeah, density. yeah, it's a column density. You call it uh, surface density. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, is what is that the the neutral gas? Is that the total column density, which then leads well, to the neutral gas? But that's the, that's the same for the kind of ionization fraction we have talked Exactly. So, what is the ionization fraction you're talking? This would be my question, actually. Ten to my well, it's less than ten to one. And, and you, you assume it, or it's it's basically constant throughout the. No, day? I take it. I take yeah. it. Oh, no, you uh, <laughs> take it from Peter, but is it is it really going? Uh, is it changing throughout the disk in the simulations? What I'm basically after is if the if the magnetic coupling would change depending on how the chemistry changes. So the coupling would change depending yeah. on the chemistry, yes. But is it not not included yet, or is it already included? So what is included is um, I go no, I won't go back. Yes, I will. Um, if I go back to say that slide, uh, so that's a map of on the polar. No, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, so that's a map of on the polar diffusion that's taken. So that includes all of the ionized species oh. you have in your system. Okay, and uh, from the map of ionized species, you can so you get abundance of yeah. all the ionized species. Mm -hmm. From that, you can compute the effective, the uh, the conductivity tensor yeah. for the MHD. Yeah. That's one of the components I'm showing here. Mm -hmm. Okay, you take that, you put that in your code. Oh, okay. So you do. Okay. Yeah. But there's a but. Uh, of course, this is steady state, assuming a this model, blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. In the plan of this model, I've shown you. Well, you have a gap, blah blah. blah. Okay, we haven't made the feedback of the gas onto the chemistry. Okay. All right. uh, and this is actually partly why we this, want is, to this, this is what I've heard. Yeah. May, may I? I have a lot of questions, so I can we can I can do one question first. Yeah. Uh, so actually, on this slide is interesting because here you said that you have because of if you include MB polar diffusion, you have a dead zone, right? Yes. But later you said you have this magnetic field line going through the disk as a bundle, and so. If on one hand you said that the disk center is non-conductive, but then you use the magnetic field line to argue that the, it it does affect the distribution of dust particle in the disk, right? So it has to be conductive somehow. So it is, how is it? Uh, it is it is a weak conductive. Uh, so the fact that you have filaments uh, threading the disk doesn't mean that it has to be conductive. No, but to, for this magnetic field line to create to create the gaps, it has to be right. Um, yes and no. Oh, and what what happens is that um, at the disk surface where you actually have some coupling, 
uh, the, the magnetic field forces the mass to redistribute. Okay, so it's really most of the activity is happening at the surface, not in the disk dog. Think of it as a you have a sort of onion, okay, and you peel the onion from the top. So the onion is the disk. Okay. So mm -hmm. you peel the, the disk from the top. So the, the middle you can't touch it, but you 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 you, you carve a from carve the top. a hole from yeah. the top until it reaches the center. Yes. And then and then of course because of hydrostatic equilibrium, eventually it's going to affect the plane. But it's not direct. If you would fit back this into this uh, this is static image, right? A static thing. Yes. If you would evolve it, you would have gaps. The gap would, would yeah. Show. But so we don't we don't evolve that. Yeah. Uh, we don't evolve that. But uh, the conductivity tensor is a funny beast in which uh, is involved the density of the gas. Uh, so there is an indirect feedback which is not shown here, uh, and that that actually induces. Uh, so on the later stage of evolution, the dead zone is not blank everywhere, right? Because through these gaps, it, it is still blank in the sense that you cannot. The, the the reason why it was called dead zone and something I did not talk about is that a dead zone is actually for the magnetic rotational instability. Okay, so it's an image the instability that happens in disk, in all disks except those, because they are too weakly organized. Um, so this is a dead zone for the MRI. And why? It's because the MRI is actually involving small eddies. Okay, so it's really a matter of scale. When you have an MHD disk wind, it's a large scale stuff. Okay, so you are not so much affected by the diffusion effects compared to the MRI. So it's dead from the MRI point of view. You cannot sustain MHD turbulence, but you can still sustain weak coupling, I should say breaking. Uh, that is sufficient to to get what you need. Uh, it's just lamina, very diffusive dynamics. Uh, questions? Yeah, you showed that with your windy disk, you can reproduce the ring gap structure that we observed in disk. How about spirals? Does it work as well? Um, not so much. Um, the thing with so in order to get spiral, you need to have some sort of more like symmetric excitation. And there is no not such a thing uh, in these models. Uh, they tend to stay, as I said, fairly laminar. Uh, so you don't have really long like symmetric excitation. So the spirals can be due to either soft turbulence or bodies embedded in the disk. I'm, I'm not claiming that they have no planets. Uh, I'm just saying that uh, you know there's this chicken and egg problem. Uh, whether the wing fall before the planet and they are therefore responsible for planet formation, or the planets are cardinal wings, wings are widow. So we start to suggest that we could imagine having wings in the first place and that enhance planet formation. And then you can have planets as well, and they tend to make spirals. Uh, that's for sure. You can also have encounters or you can have them, yeah. right? So I think many of these spirals, the nice spirals you see with armor are now have been identified that there is actually a companion. Binary, some sort of binarity. So then every wave, normal gas yeah, here, it would translate into a spiral wave. Spiral is essentially a wake of something. Um, so it's a wake, the trace of something, you know, passing by in a lake. You have a duck traveling in a lake that makes a wake. Okay, so same thing here. You have a body passing by the disk, it makes a wake, and you see that as a spiral. So anything basically can be. And then maybe? Yeah, very nice talk. So I have a, several questions, maybe just one. Uh, following this point of uh, uh, rings, so, so you said when you include non-ideal MHD effects, they just arise, yeah, substructure. But what's the fundamental reason? And does it arise only in axisymmetric simulations or full 3D simulations also? Because in axisymmetry, anything that arises, you can interpret as rings, which is not necessarily true. No, 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 no. Uh, it arises. Um, um, so it, it is true that most of the models published today focus on uh, axisymmetric models. That is true. But there are non-axisymmetric models that show exactly the same thing. Uh, so the, um, um, the model by Suriano, the one from Betun, are 3D. Uh, the, So that, that guy here, that, there's a 3D version of that in this paper. Uh, one of those papers is 3D, and that one is 3D. 
What's the fundamental reason? Reason for what? For doing three things? Yeah, formation of rings. Ah. Um, <laughs> it has to do with um, essentially a story of uh, field inclination. What happens is that um, if you assume that you have this portion, uh, you have a, a weak defect in the density distribution. Okay. So let's assume you have a fluctuation in density distribution, small one. Okay. So in this particular region, um, what's going to happen is um, uh, you will have less mass, and therefore the magnetization, that is the ratio of uh, magnetic pressure to internal pressure, is going to increase. So your sphere lines will become stronger relatively to the rest. Okay. And it will tend to straighten. In these models of MHDD screen, the field is essentially toroidal. So it's like a, something like that. Okay. Now, in the region where you start to have this defect, it goes straight about, meaning that you're going to decrease the magnetic pressure because it will get straighter. And if you decrease the magnetic pressure, then the ions will be automatically attracted to that defect. So they will bring the surrounding material, the surrounding magnetic field with them, and it's going to re amplify the field. So you will have a flow of ion which will try to fill the gap, bringing. <laughs> bringing with it uh, the field lines, but it's going to self-amplify. It's going to remove the mass because the wind will become more efficient. So it's going to make a plume of material. It's going to accumulate the field lines. And it's it's essentially a result of ions trying to refill the gap because of the change of field geometry. But it's um, you have to write it down to actually figure out. It's quite complex. But um, So this was maybe yes. one. One of the most brilliant physicists I know of, and, and, and it's the fish. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's no, but that one, that one is debated. <laughs> okay, maybe I, I take the, the privilege to ask the last question. Yeah. You commented on these gaps that they cannot hold gas accretion. Maybe you know that at the moment with JWST, there's a lot of discussion about this pebble accretion nodes so, so the, the transport on elements on top of pebbles yes. so i wanted maybe to invite you to comment on that so if you are able to say lock an element in pebbles and somehow the disk structure is such that the, all the pebbles get stuck in a certain place but the gas continues then you can have very peculiar element abundances in that gas and we think we see that now in jwst but it's in this JWST um, community, it's, it's a guessing game, that's yes. my impression. So they assume just something. So can you comment on this? How, how is this possible to lock an element in pebbles that are not going? Possible to lock an element in pebbles, yes. Um, but it's, it will not be, I mean, I don't know how efficient it will be. Uh, first, because, um, so, you still have, as you might see here, there's still some activity. Okay. You, you, you had one slide where you had these arrows, the gas finds a way, but this was gas, right? This was not. Yeah, that, uh, that one. No, this was another slide. The, the, gap, the, the gap slide. One, one more. Yeah. Um, we had the streamlines. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, but, but that was for the planet stuff. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. That's that one, right? So yes. you can okay. kind of. Try to understand how the gas actually gets by the planet. Yes. What happens to the grains here and to the pebbles? I don't know. We have nothing to do with grains. So I can guess, I can tell you. I mean, the guess is that it's going to stop here because here it's a pressure maximum. Uh, so pebbles will, just like an ordinary gas, I would say. Now, uh, Life is not that simple. Uh, so that would be what happens in 3D. Now it's 3D. You might see here you have walls, mm -hmm. and it's very possible that because of 3D effect, a fraction of the pebbles will be lifted up and will eventually fall down. And if they are lifted up, they can also actually the guys the, the ice might come off. Yes. And that's the effect. We don't we are, we don't really need to understand the pebbles. We need to understand the ice that is transported. Yes. With so I mean the. The thing is, the double is, is in the 3D part of it. Um, in 2D, everything looks simple. In 3D, because you have a circulation which is not simple, um, you might be able to pass through. Uh, what you would have thought was a rigid barrier in 2D. 
so then one needs to actually figure out how much uh, can get through, and that, I don't have the answer to that. Right, I think then we think the city again. After this talk, but after that, we will again meet, for example, Mercury or so, so everybody who has maybe other questions to hopefully uh, tell me or just pass by. And if you are interested to join us for dinner, let me know. Can you boil some more water? Yes, one is peach. No worries. Yeah, can I join? Yeah, the meeting after that. For the moment, it's pretty fast. 